We welcome you this morning uh, to today's service as we celebrate the life and the legacy of Karen Johnston Parade. Uh, we offer our sympathy to the Parade family and pray that they will be comforted at this time. We would like to thank all those that helped prepare for this funeral, for those that have traveled to provide comfort for the family and to honor Sister Parade. I am Mark Rice. I'm the Bishop of the Battle Creek Fourth Court, and I will be conducting today's service. Our music will be provided by Sister Kathy Bird and Sister Claudine Doyle. Uh, we will begin today by singing hymn number 193, I Stand All Amazed, following which the opening prayer will be given by East End Cassidy. <coughs>
Father, we come before thee this day to celebrate the life of Karen Ferre, our grandmother, our mother, and our friend. Father, we ask that thou would bless that throughout this day we'll fill thy love and thy spirit and thy comfort. We ask that thou will be able to help us celebrate our grandma the way that she would like us to. We ask that thou will be with those that will share stories and, and speak to us today, that thou will comfort them, help them to share the things that, that they are wanting to share with us. Prepare for thy love, prepare for thy plan of salvation, and prepare for the gospel that we have in our lives. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to all be here, and we're grateful for those that came to support the family, and we're grateful for thy love. And we ask and pray for this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. you to bear with us. Armand Karen Johnston Furry was born on December 21st, 1941 to Oliver Farron and Beth Pullman Johnston in Bremerton, Washington, four days before Christmas and two weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. She was born a few weeks early, so her, her parents spent their first Christmas as husband and wife in the hospital. The first year of her life, she was ill a great deal and cried most of the time. Mom grew up in Bremerton. She was the oldest of three children. She has two younger brothers, Carl, who's 13 months younger, and Dan, who's four years younger. She had naturally curly hair and was pigeon-toed, so she wore high-top shoes. She hated being pigeon-toed and begged her mom to buy her pretty shoes, as all the other girls were wearing. Grandma's nickname for her was Sue. She didn't know why her mom called her that. She did just fit. She remembers her having tea parties, with her mom and playing with her toy iron and ironing board while Grandma Johnston went out. A fun memory mom shared about her mom was the first time they lived in a big, in their home had a big picture window. One winter on mom's birthday, she was sick and couldn't go outside and play in the snow. So her mom went out and built a snowman and threw snowballs at the window while mom stood on the couch and watched. When mom was younger, she remembers laying on the floor listening to mysteries on the big tall radio they had in, the, in their living room. They didn't have a TV until she was 10 years old. Summer trips as a, as a family were spent at Puget, Puget Sound while Grandpa Jay fished for salmon, picnicking at Hood's Canal and traveling to Salt Lake City to see both sets of her grandparents. Her favorite vacation memory was when she and her brothers traveled with their Grandma Johnston on a passenger train to Salt Lake City. They spent two months, two months in Salt Lake spending time with both sets of grandparents. When her parents picked them up, they took them on a family vacation to Yellowstone. Mom's family favorite um, family traditions on Christmas were taking um, Christmas, sorry. Mom's fa favorite family traditions were taking a drive on Christmas Eve after dinner to see a beautiful nativity that was lit up seeing all the Christmas lights as they drove around, and listening to her dad read a nativity story from Luke. Some of her most cherished Christmas gifts 
as a child where the table, bench, and cradle her dad made for her. When she was growing up, um, the weekend before Christmas, they would cut down a Christmas tree and decorate it with assorted glass balls and lots of icicles. Sometimes they got to cut down their own small tree for their bedrooms and decorate them. She also loved being able to pick out what she wanted for her birthday dinner, and the best part was that she didn't have to do any chores that day. When it was time to do dishes, Grandma Johnson would assign who cleaned the table, swept the floor, and washed and dried the dishes. When it was Carl's turn to dry, he complained to Karen, but she was too slow. So Mom would complain to Grandma Johnson, who invariably let Mom go and made Carl wash, dry, and put away all the dishes. <laughs> Mom grew up in a Christ Center home where she was taught the importance of family, personal prayer, and to follow the prophet. Mom was baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when she was eight years old in the swimming pool at the MYCI. Mom attended school in Bremerton. She skipped class one time with her friends and said it wasn't very fun at all. She was so worried the entire time she'd get caught. One day she stayed home from school telling her mom she didn't feel well. She said she didn't really feel sick, but she stayed home in bed all day and played with paper dolls. When her mom, when her folks got home from work, they announced they were going to take them all to the movie. But since Karen didn't feel well, they better stay home. She said, talk about a quick recovery. And we got and we got to go. Mom said we hadn't been there long when I got sick and upchucked all over my mom. She ended up having scarlatina and was sick for several days. Mom was very popular with classmates and teachers. Teachers considered her as an example of the ideal student. And no one and, and no surprise, her favorite subject was home economics. She liked cooking, learning about nutrition, and, and the clothing classes. Her senior year, she was on the yearbook staff, dance committee, a member of the pop, the pep club, and sang in the senior group. She went to homecoming class or homecoming dance. Her senior year was Steve McLeod, and they were chosen a senior couple of the ball. On June 10, 1960, Mom graduated from high school, from East High School. <coughs> Mom was 17 years old when she got her driver's license. She didn't have driver's education in school, so dad, so her dad taught her. She said she thinks she was scared. She thought she scared him to death right after she had she got her driver's license. She was driving from Tacoma to Bremerton and got pulled over for driving too slow. This wasn't the only time she got pulled over <coughs> driving too slow. I recall when we were driving to Salt Lake to the Christmas shop. I think it was and we got pulled over again for driving too slow. I think she was doing 55 in a 65. In the fall of 1960, Mom moved to Provo, Utah to attend Brigham Young University. It was not long after she moved to Provo during her freshman year, and that was where she met the love of her life. Michael Warren Frick. The first date was at High Spot in Orem. They got a pepperoni pizza, and it was the first time she had ever had pizza. Surprising. She thought Dad was fun to be with, thoughtful, cute, and had a nice car. Go figure. <laughs> One time he picked her up in his work clothes, drove to a road that was out of the way from traffic, stopped his car, turned up the radio, and they danced in the middle of the road. Mom and Dad got engaged. When Dad took his clash ring on the speaker and slid a diamond ring back on, it was dark in the car, but she could tell it wasn't his clash ring and felt it with her other fingers. She made a decision to go against her parents' wishes, which she had never done, and she knew she had made the best decision of her life to marry Dad. They were married two months later, on October 5, 1961, in the Salt Lake Temple. After they were sealed, they walked down a spiral staircase, and Dad leaned over to Mom and whispered, you were fighting mine. They would have celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary this October on the 5th. They made their home in Pleasant Grove. Mom gave birth to five children, Todd, Laura, Marshall, Nicole, and Mike. In 1977, Marshall's close friend, Joanna, 
came to live with their family, and she became their sixth child and fifth daughter, poor Todd. <laughs> when Todd was six months old, Mom went back to school at Brigham Young University. She graduated with her bachelor's degree in home economics, and in 1969, after three more pregnancies, and one on the way. Mom began teaching at Pleasant Grove High School for a few years before transferring to American Fort Junior High, where she loved and admired her students and those she worked with. On April Fool's Day, uh, Mom and her friend Suzanne Keach, who she taught home ec with, decided to play a joke and put a large bowl of peanuts with crushed red pepper flakes in the faculty room. People would take a handful and pop them in their mouth. Several couldn't figure out what was in the peanuts to make them so spicy. No one figured out that it was the two sweet ladies, like the home ec teachers, that put them in there. After teaching for 27 years, Mom retired and her and Dad bought a fifth wheel trailer and enjoyed traveling with friends and spending time in St. George. In 2005, they were called to serve a mission with their close friends, Doug and Marlene Waite, in the Liviana, Sylvania mission. They served for 23 months, where Michael was the regular dad, was the branch president in Marlboro. Serving the members of Marlboro Branch was a very special time in their lives, and they became very close to the members. After they returned home from the mission, they served in the Mount Tipinogos Temple for three years in the Bachelor Street. Mom enjoyed cooking, traveling with Dad and their friends. She was 67 when she started to learn how to piece quilts. She started to piece, turning 20 quilts and enjoyed making them. She made many beautiful quilts for her children and her grandchildren. These quilts are the treasure for each one of us. Some of Mom's most treasured experiences in the church were receiving her endowments being sealed to Dad, the blessings and baptisms of each of their children, being in the temple with her children as they were sealed to their companions. Witnessing Brian and Nicole being sealed to their children, being, being with Michael when he was called to be bishop and serving in their mission. Mom's creed for living a good life was to be honest, strive to follow Jesus Christ, and to live her life in a way that others will see and feel the blessings of the gospel in her life. She lost some advice she would like to each of her children and grandchildren to know on their wedding day. Be patient and considerate to each other. Do not let little things become big things. Make the needs and desires of the other person. Become more important than yourself. Pray together before retiring to bed. Make an effort to never go to bed angry. Be the one who says, I am sorry, or please forgive me. Pray every day, read your scriptures, make the gospel the center of your individual lives and the center of your home. Mom passed away on Tuesday, March 5th, surrounded by her loving family. Mom was a loving example to her family of commitment, sacrifice, love, and devotion. We all knew that she had a deep love for her Savior, Jesus Christ. She lived a life of Christ-like service and love. We are so grateful for the memory, many memories we have, we have on Sunday evenings at Mom and Dad's house, family vacations in Lake Powell, Christmas time, celebrating all the holidays, birthdays, graduations, sports teams, and most recently, our family cruise to Alaska. We are so grateful to Mom and Dad for creating lasting, these lasting memories. We will cherish these memories and everything she has taught us. We are grateful she is at peace and no longer suffering from the elements of her mortal body. We are grateful for the knowledge of the plan of salvation and know we will see our beloved wife, mother, grandmother, great mother, and friend again. As Jeffrey R. Holland said, don't underestimate your family on the other side of the bed. We know that Mom will continue to be there and help and protect all of us, just as she always has. What a glorious day it will be when we are all reunited again. We also want to thank our dad for his constant love and care of Mom. 
It's really exemplified what it means to express Christ like love. There was a spirit in their home that was undeniable. She believed they were both being watched over and comforted. She had been such a great example to each one of us. We love you, Dad. Thank you for being an amazing husband, Dad, Grandpa, Great Grandpa. We hope we can be just like you one day. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.
who Sam needs lots of prayers. I have had a struggle less of a time last night at three in the morning. I locked myself in the bathroom. Like I couldn't, I like had to put my back to the tub and push on my feet. The doorknob broke. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm gonna sleep here all night. And um, and then I had the thought, you know what? I'm just gonna try it. And I said, I said a prayer. And I said, Heavenly Father, can grandma unlock the bathroom for me? <laughs> I don't want to sleep here. It was like 3.30. And the door, um, I'm locked. I was able to get out. And I know that's silly. Another example of just the silly things we do. But I, I just want to begin by testifying that she's still here. When we step on nails or lock ourselves in bathrooms or get ourselves in really big pickles. He 
has overcome the world. For verily I say unto you, Blessed is he or she that keepeth my commandments, whether in life or in death. And she that is faithful in tribulation, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Ye cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the desire of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation, in the past few years have had all tribulation, come the blessings, wherefore the day coming she will be crowned with me with much glory. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives. He lives who once was dead. And so will she. There's love and grief beyond degree. The Lord of glory died for me. The lowest said in joys were heard. The Lord, though dead, revived again. The rising Lord forsook the tomb. In vain the tomb forbade him rise. True with legions guard him home and shout him welcome to the skies. And last of all, in the words of Elder Uchtdorf, in light of what we know about eternal destiny, is it any wonder that whenever we face the bitter endings of life, they seem unacceptable to us? There seems to be something inside of us that resists endings. Why is this? Because we are made of the stuff of eternity. We are eternal beings. Endings are not our destiny. The more we learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more we realize that endings here in mortality are not endings at all. They are merely interruptions, temporary pauses that one day will seem small compared to the eternal joy awaiting the faithful. And I know sometimes that seems like a platitude when you're suffering, like it'll be okay, you'll see her again. But if this weren't true, then what's the point? But today does not mark the ending of my grandma's life. It does not mark the ending of my grandparents' marriage because of their temple ceiling. It does not mark the ending of her relationship as my grandma. And it does not mark the ending of her story. Because of him, not only will she live again in her body, but she lives now. One of my regrets is not remembering all of her advice she gave me when her mind was fully healthy. My coworker told me, she said, let her give you advice now. All the things she would say, maybe live our lives in such a way to hear them. I say this in the name of him who's going to make it all possible, even my Jesus and yours, amen.
Today we're excited to share just a glimpse of those cherished memories and the profound influence she had on each of us. Growing up, Grandma would take many of us to lunch on a lunch date for our birthdays, and then afterward we'd go and pick out a toy, or um, a lot of them did build a bear. And um, she would let us choose where we went to eat, even if it wasn't her favorite place to go. And often, um, some of the times we didn't have more than one of us go with her. It was a really special time to connect and to fill with her love. Um, she would organize sleepovers during the holidays when our parents needed help or other times throughout the year, complete with different activities like mini golf for the boys, sewing lessons for the girls, where we learned to make pajama pants and pillowcases. Um, one time, we were making, Aubrey and I had cast, uh, we were making pajama pants, and actually I had a little of us in the pajama pants, um, but the new Britney Spears CD had come out, and I had got it, I was a big Britney fan, and we drove to get pizza, and we're at the Little Caesars parking lot, and we put in the, the CD, and Grandma's like, let's listen to Lucky. And so she started singing Lucky. Um, at the time, I was kind of embarrassed that my grandma knew Britney Spears songs, but now I look back and it's something that I will always remember. Um, just, she always tried to be so hit. And, um, but she was very hit. Um, one of grandma's best friends, we talked about Suzanne earlier, um, worked with her at the junior high. Um, she was telling me the other last week about some funny stories that Grandma heard, the pranks they would pull. And we talked about the, the Peanuts one, but there was also one, there was a science teacher, or the first day of, of school, um, Grandma would do a presentation or they'd make scones, and that she would let the teachers you know, eat some. And there was a science teacher that wanted one, but he couldn't come down to get it. Um, and so Grandma decided to, and Suzanne decided to slice it in half, the scone, and put a bunch of mustard on it, and then fold it back over and put a bunch of honey butter, and he bit into that and then chased them with the iguana. <laughs> Grandma didn't like those types of things, so. <laughs> Most of us grew up going on a family vacation to Lake Powell every year. Because of Grandma and Grandpa, this is a tradition that many of us love. We have, oh, so we have a lot, of, a lot of fun fond memories with Grandma, um, with her perfectly done hair and makeup, writing her annual mom too bright, where she would make all of us laugh, and she may have even peed her pants a few times. <laughs> Lake Powell also carries with it some difficult memories for our family. Grandma and Grandpa were anchored in those times and tried hard to help each of us process and grieve when needed. Grandma and Grandpa always took time to come to any of our special events in life. They came to every baby blessing, baptism, missionary farewell, homecoming, wedding, and graduation. Grandma would sit in the bleachers at sporting events and keep track of steps and cheer us on. She made such an effort to understand and find joy in the things that mattered to us. Grandma had a beautiful singing voice. Many of us remember sitting by her at church and listening to her sing or going on car rides when she would sing along to the radio. She had a love of beautiful music and a deep love for the hymns. Even as her memory started to decline, a few of the grandkids remember listening to her sing every word of those hymns. Grandma had a love for education and felt very strongly that her posterity needed to do everything they could to get as much education as possible. She pulled many of the grandchildren aside and made sure they knew how important she felt their education was, while at the same time making sure that they knew she believed in them. She knew that they could do it. She also spoke to many of us who didn't pursue our education and tried very hard to encourage us toward, the, toward that path. Although I know she wanted us to get our degrees, she never made us feel like her love was dependent on it. Grandma had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
She was so concerned about us and wanted to make sure we were okay. She held Samantha while she cried and made an effort to talk to many of us about her love for us and to let us know it would be okay. As Grandma's health declined and, and her memory started to fade, so many of us had beautiful experiences that reminded us that even if she couldn't remember our names, she knew us. She loved us and our lives mattered to her. When life got hard for some of us, smile 
God and she'd be like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, even my sister-in-law, first time she met my grandpa and grandma, she hugged my grandpa. And grandma got right up and was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, last while I, I've looked at it as I had an opportunity to serve and to love and to relieve some, a little bit of stress, even if it was just a little bit. Um, a couple weeks after grandma passed, I realized that I wasn't doing any of that for grandma or grandma. They had it. They were good. Um, God wanted me to be there for me. I needed it for me. I needed it so that I could have that spirit with me and be able to sit with grandma. I, there were so many times that we'd sit in quiet or watch a show and she would rub my hands and hold my hand. God is in the details. I'm so thankful for the opportunities I had. We, again, we just want to tell Grandpa we love him and thank him for what he's done for her and for us and his example. Grandma, we love you. I used to always say to her, this is a goodbye, it's just see you later. So we'll see you soon, Grandma. Say you soon, same Jesus Christ. Amen. start by um, thanking all the grandkids and, and great grandkids for saving the miracle. Um, I know most of them were very apprehensive about it, but I was immensely impressed by their willingness to do. As you arrived today, um, I would think all of you know this, the American flags and the war line flags outside this chapel. Usually that is something that is done at the boss of a law enforcement officer. My dad felt strongly back. My mom deserved as much credit as he does for his service, for his 40 years of service in law enforcement. He does not feel like he could have done it without her. Um, so because of that, the Pleasant Valley Police Department uh, graciously has placed those flags here so that we can recognize uh, my mom for her service to the community. Uh, as you know, my mom's career was outside, uh, her career outside of the house was a school teacher. In the home, she focused on being a homemaker, teacher, care, caregiver, and support to her children and her husband. Police officers' wives don't have badges, don't make arrests, don't drive a patrol car, but they are an integral part of the police officer's life. They are the glue behind the lights and the sirens at home. They are the one constant in a fast-paced, overwhelming, overwhelming career. Police officers, wives, or friends, counselors, confidants, mothers, and a place of peace and refuge. Some things that police officers, wives deal with, um, and there's, there's a lot longer list than this, but um, my, mom's, my mom's heart 
left every day when my dad went to work. It was our fourth year. She got to the point that she wasn't afraid to spend nights alone because he was out working. She, not, she knew not to get too excited when the end of his schedule shift was coming out, or if he had the opportunity to call her sometime during the shift, uh, she didn't get too excited that he was coming home too quick because she knew that the odds were he was going to be far later than was anticipated. One thing that police officers' wives learn quickly is that if they are in a public place, a restaurant, or anything else, the mom, my, my mom's, my wife's for that matter, back is always at the door. Because as a police officer, you want to feel the security of having a wall behind your back so you can watch the door. Um, One of the rules that I read, that I read from the police officer wives bulletin board said to love, love hard. My mom loved my dad. With everything she had. And that love was reciprocated. They work hard through their marriage to understand each other and to always support each other. My dad felt my mom's love every time he went out to work. He felt so strong with his dad when he was on patrol. She was in the seat next to him. She always felt his, he always felt her spirit and knew that she was there. And at times, even he would hear her helping him in dealing with the difficulties of his day. When my dad came home from work, there are a lot of times that police officers have uh, almost every day you deal with stuff that is pleasant. But there are times that you need to be able to discuss that. There are times that they are so unpleasant that you just don't want your spouse to have to live it with you. So it's a balancing act for the wife to know whether or not to get to push, to try and uh, understand what they're going through, or just to let it go. And figure that when the husband is able to discuss it, that he will. And at that point, they can help him through. But my mom did that all the time. Um, as most of you know, I also uh, had a career in law enforcement, not quite as long as my dad's, but um, all of these things that I'm talking about with my mom, um, I want to recognize my wife for. I could not have come without her.
And there were several quotes. Well, one particular quote that I was going to talk about, but Marshall already gave it. So I will skip over that. But um, he did say there is no love. Immortality comes closer to the, the proximity of the pure love of Jesus Christ than the selfless love of, of a devoted, and I, I put in wife here as well, wife and mother, that they have for their husbands and their, ch and their children. That exemplifies my mom. She loved children with all her heart. And she made sure that we knew it that well. Even when she might be getting after us for not necessarily following the commandments as she thought we should. She always did it with love. Um, I've got more here, but I think I'm going to close. Um, close by just saying that my mom will continue to be near us. I look forward to the day that I can see her lovely smile again. One thing that brings me peace is I know that she's holding me. And the one of the songs that were on the video out there, and it's the last song that's on the video, it's called Scars for the Devil. The line in there just tears me up. But it is so so it says, um, it says the only stars in heaven are the ones that hold you now.
as she did a symbolic day of baptism, conquering both sin and death through the resurrection and atonement of our Savior Jesus Christ. And we will again enjoy her association. And that will be a glorious day. Our sympathy goes out to the Foray family in this time of sorrow and parting. We hope that you will find comfort and hope in the promises of our Savior. I know this is true. I know that we can be with our families together forever. And what a blessing that will be for us. And I hope that we find comfort with each other and through the Savior. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the closing prayer, or sorry, the, uh, the closing song will be I Know That My Redeemer Lives, page 136, following which the closing prayer will be given by George Smith.
to be here and celebrate one of your amazing daughters. We're grateful to this, for the spirit that's been here. Grateful for the words that have been spoken, the songs that have been sang, the testimonies that have been born. Father, we ask that the Spirit may remain with us. Please bless those who are mourning and grieving. Give us the strength to comfort those who need comfort and mourn with those who are mourning. Help us to remember this day going forward and remember our grandma. And strive to be one of her and our Savior. Watch over us this day and protect us. Please be with those who have traveled.